Hi, today's good person to know is Ian Martin. He's commentator, writer and author of Making It Happen, Fred Goodwin, RBS and The Men Who Blew Up the British Economy. I wanted to know Ian's reasons for writing the book and he said he couldn't understand how a small high street bank became the largest bank in the world and then helped blow up the UK economy. Ian is a Scotsman, so I can see why he was so deeply rooted into trying to find out exactly what happened. He interviewed all the major players and his book is as true as a can as you'll get. In this video, Ian explains what his research uncovered and said people in senior positions of authority were ultimately responsible, that the board failed to ask simple basic questions and that the real driver behind it was George Matheson. He wanted RBS to be the biggest bank in the world at all costs, stopping at nothing. What a short-sighted vision that was because yes, while Royal Bank of Scotland became the biggest bank in the world, all for a few seconds, the UK government had to do a bailout and now Matheson's beloved bank is nationalised. Fred Goodwin was Matheson's yes man and effectively carried out Matheson's vision. Goodwin embarked on an aggressive expansion strategy where he led a consortium of banks to acquire AB and AMRO, all because he didn't want Barclays to beat them at the post of being the biggest bank in the world. Ego, saving face and personality clash is what caused RBS and the UK economy to blow up. I don't want to give too much away because it's a compelling story and his video is just a snippet of his book. In a nutshell, it's about one man's determination to make his dream come true. He recruited people to action it regardless of the consequences. This is an example of how not to lead a bank, a business or an institution. I hope you enjoy it and thank you for watching. Why did you write this book? Uh, I wrote this book because I thought it was the most extraordinary human story. I felt, as a journalist, I felt I'd lived through a once in a century financial disaster and I felt, as a journalist, I didn't really understand it. It didn't make any sense to me. How this small modest Scottish institution that I knew from coming from Scotland, how had this turned itself into the biggest bank in the world and helped blow up the UK economy and it just it didn't make sense to me so I wanted to go and interview as many of the key people involved as possible and try and answer the question what the hell did they think they were doing. 19th century Scotland is miles ahead of England in terms of finance and being innovative and brilliant at banking. And RBS is at the forefront of that, inventing all sorts of uh, things, uh, like the, the modern the overdraft, and various other things. And then you get to the 1980s, and Scotland just seemed to have been brilliant at finance, uh, but these banks, like the Bank of Scotland, the Royal Bank of Scotland, are now really struggling. <coughs> You're in a country that's lost its heavy industry, or is losing its heavy industry. How is Scotland going to reinvent itself? And one of the ways, one of the key drivers of an attempt to reinvent the Scottish economy is George Matthewson again, who's running the Government Development Agency, uh, the old SDA. And he thinks that Scotland's future is oil, fair enough, uh, some computing, what became Silicon Glen, and financial services. He then moves to uh, the Royal Bank of Scotland and embarks on this incredible process of change. He chooses his own chairman, Sir Tom McKillop, who must be a Scot, so that it retains its Scottish links and its Scottish uh, heritage. Back to the mid-1990s, RBS is a small, Presbyterian, relatively modest Scottish bank. A proud history in Scotland and all the rest of it, but it's, you know, this is a, this is a, a bank threatened twice with takeover, it appears that it's, that it's going to be obliterated. Um, or, so it buys into the idea that it has to kill or be killed, it has to keep on growing, it has to expand at a rate that means that it can't be um, taken over. And its chief executive of the period, George Matthewson, has a mantra, because we maybe come to the patriotism angle uh, uh, as well in a minute, because I think it really, I think it's essential to understanding the RBS story. And his mantra is, where is it written that Scotland can't have the biggest, straight, the best bank uh, in the world? Well, at the time, it seems like an incredible success story. Scotland is go RBS is going from being that small institution that we described in under a decade, it is one of the biggest banks in Europe, and then in 2007, briefly, it becomes the biggest bank in the world on a balance sheet. So I think there is huge excitement and pride on the board at being involved in something which is expanding so quickly, which is becoming a global brand. Uh, and I think they just don't, it's not that the board is terrified, don't, I mean there's a misconception. Bits of the management below are terrified, but the board are not in fear of Goodwin. I mean Goodwin 
manage the board actually from his point of view very effectively and is very polite to board members. The outgoing chairman chooses his successor and says, there you go, I've found the perfect guy and the board waves it through. Absolute calamity. If an outsider had come in and if corporate governance had worked properly and the board had insisted on it, the board should have objected to the way in which the search had been done for a chairman and the senior non-exec should have should have taken charge of process. So all the normal checks and balances completely broke down in RBS. If that had happened and an outsider had come in, there's a pretty good chance that their first job, if they understood banking, would have been to say, right, we've got to start thinking about how we move good bit on. A failure above the CEO in that you have a board which simply doesn't do its, its basic job in terms of uh, diligence, asking the right questions, uh, ensuring that corporate governance is applied. And then below that, you have uh, a senior management team of executives who are, in some, uh, in some way, some of them claim to be sort of almost you know, petrified or fearful and say that Goodwin created a, a, a climate of fear. But the personality clash between John Varley, then running Barclays, and Fred Goodwin running RBS is central to, uh, to what unfolded in that they both, I mean Goodwin used to say just he wanted to be bigger than Barclays and he became also almost obsessed with becoming bigger than Barclays. Varley uh, looked down on uh, Goodwin as a bit of a hick uh, and there was just a real grudge match between them. The whole thing at every stage was tell us how we can do this deal, you know, don't flag up <coughs> problems that, uh, you know, inconvenient uh, difficulties and it just became became a media. I think also the other personality aspect of it that's fascinating is that Goodwin, having been put there by Santander and Fortis as the chairman of the consortium, he was going to lead the bid and everything, remember, was then going to come onto RBS's balance sheet and then be distributed to the others. Um, Goodwin, I think, got so far down the line that he didn't want to be humiliated in front of his peers. I mean, he's one of the biggest CEOs in Banking CEOs in the world, it would have taken. It would have been quite a difficult thing, a very brave thing to do to say in September 2007. Lots of people were urging, urging to lots of financial commentators. Actually, no, what's out of this? It would cost a few hundred million pounds to get RBS out of it, but this is the wrong deal at the wrong moment. Instead, he just plows ahead, and they realise instantly, within within a couple of days, they realise it's a, it, it's a complete. Uh, car crash and disaster. Santander got, as you indicated, the bits that it really wanted, some brilliant bits of business, and spun on one of them, an Italian bank, um, within a matter of weeks, making a massive profit, can't remember the precise figure. And at that point, RBS knew that they'd been left with the left with the junk. So it was just, it was, again, I hadn't thought about it these times, again, it comes down to that personal relationship which Bhutan played brilliantly to his advantage. He had a connection with Matthewson and Goodwin and exploited it brilliantly. If RBS hadn't done the deal, its balance sheet would have been about half the size. It would have still encountered serious problems. It's an investment bank would have still had a massive holes in it. Uh, but it's probably fair to say that it could have, like Barclays, just about scraped, uh, scraped through. Everyone thinks that there was a proper inquiry, that, that there was a commission of inquiry into RBS. There wasn't. There was a big FSA document, which was effectively an inquiry into John Cameron, the guy who ran the investment bank, because he was trying to get another job in the city. They expanded that, didn't interview many of the key witnesses, badged it as an inquiry into the collapse of the Royal Bank of Scotland.